In today's video, I'm gonna show you how to make an animated title card that's dynamic in Cinema 4D. Stay tuned. Welcome back. My name is Nick from Grayscale Gorilla, helping you make better renders in less time. Now, if you're new to the YouTube page, please make sure to subscribe down below if you want more tutorials just like this for Cinema 4D, After Effects, design tutorials. We do a bunch of stuff here. Please make sure to subscribe. And if you haven't done so already, check out our intro to Cinema 4D page. If you're just getting started with Cinema 4D, it's the best way to learn in the shortest amount of time. We're gonna link it up down in the description below and I'll try to add a little card as well. All right, let's get into the tutorial. Today we're gonna be making this. It's an animated dynamic title sequence. It allows you to type whatever word, phrase, your boyfriend, your girlfriend's name into it and it'll draw on and it'll animate dynamically. We're gonna go into uh, hard body dynamics inside of Cinema 4D. We're also gonna get into the variation shader. And if you stay tuned a little bit later in the tutorial, I'm gonna show you how I get these exact reflections and textures inside of Cinema 4D. All right, if you're ready, I'm ready. Let's go head on into Cinema 4D and let's go animate this thing. All right, here we are in Cinema 4D, and like most of our tutorials, I like to start from scratch so that you could follow along and build exactly what we're building. So the first thing we need to do is start to get the words all set up, and for that we need a spline. If you come up to this menu here, you can go to a text spline, and this is where we're going to spell out what words we want to animate. And in this case, you could put your name. You know, I could put my name here. Uh, the other thing I want to do with this spline is I want it to be centered. I don't want it to be left justified. And that's the default. And if you click on your text down here, you'll see all the options. You can just grab it and go middle. Okay. So now that we have that, let's start to get our clones uh, cloned onto this. And all the clone is, is just a particle. And if you're new to Cinema 4D, uh, you'll see this, you'll see me use this menu a lot. It's the MoGraph menu. And inside of here, you're gonna see a cloner. And all a cloner is, is an object that when you put objects, other objects inside of it, it'll clone whatever you put inside of it. So in this case, let's grab a sphere, let's put it inside the cloner. And you can see by default, the cloner is gonna have three of these objects. And if you select your sphere here, you can actually shrink this down. We don't want it to be too large because we want each one of these little uh, spheres here to kind of spell out the words. Okay, so the cloner's nice. We could, we could turn this up and down. We could set our mode to something like uh, grid array. This will give us a bunch of stuff. But in all these cases, what we really want is for our cloner to clone onto our text. So what we wanna do is we wanna go to object mode and we need to drag in what we want it to clone onto. In this case, it's the text. So let's grab our text and drag it into our object. And you can see now our spheres are being cloned onto the text. Now, by default, it's a little spread out. It's not very consistent, but we have some options. If we click on our cloner, you can see in here we have distribution count and we could turn up this number and we can get more clones. Let me shrink that sphere down a little bit more. I'm just gonna grab our sphere, grab our scale tool and just drag down just like that. You can see what's happening though is in this count mode, it's a little inconsistent. Sometimes they're close together, sometimes they're far apart. I want this to be kind of even when it spells out. So let's try some of these other distribution modes. Let's just click on it, go to step mode, Step mode looks good. Let's turn down our step mode. And what this does is it just reduces the amount of spacing. You can see already we're getting a more consistent pattern. It's almost like light bulbs on a marquee or something. That's a maybe a, an effect you could play with a little bit later. Uh, but for now, we're, we want those to be really close together. I'm gonna set it to three centimeters. That just means they're a little bit closer together. And you can see now we have a sphere kind of representing each part of the spline. Okay, so that's getting there. What about the spelling on of the um, the effect, the animation? Well, if we come down to this here, this start and end, you can see that this actually turns on the clones for each letter. And that's a cool effect. It goes, you can animate this on. Uh, but I actually want it to start with the first uh, part of the text and then animate all the way to the right. And to do that, you could just turn off per segment and now you can animate this and it goes, brum, 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 spells out all the splines. Okay, so 
let's go ahead and do that. Um, let's go ahead and animate this so it starts here and ends there. And the way to do that, really simply, and if you're new to Cinema 4D, I know there's a lot going on right now, but trust me, you could follow along, you could do this. If you're not new and you're just refreshing, you know, bear with me as I make sure that everybody's following along here. The end um, animation, we could set it at zero. Let's go to keyframe zero here on our timeline. And then I'm going to hit command and click on this dot. And that just set a keyframe for 0%. Okay, now we can jump to the end of our animation. We could turn this up all the way to 100%. And then I'm going to do it again. Command, click. And that's going to set a final keyframe. And it's going to animate between it. So now when we hit play on our timeline here, it's going to animate all together. Okay, so that's pretty cool. However, it's not doing all the dynamics, right? It's just all these spheres are jumping on and they're all touching and they're not doing all the cool dynamic stuff that you saw in the, um, the final piece. Dynamics in Cinema 4D are really simple to add. And all you have to do is on the object you want to be dynamic, you need to go in your tags menu and find the simulation tags um, dropdown. Now, if you don't have this, it may be because you have different version of Cinema 4D. I'm running, um, uh, first of all, version R16, um, but I'm, or I'm sorry, this is 17, and I'm also uh, running the studio version, which basically means I have all the stuff. So if you, if this isn't here, it might be because you're you using a different version. I just wanted to let you know I'm running studio. In simulation tags, you could click rigid body, and by default, it's going to be dynamic. So what this really means is each one of these particles are going to act like, you know, like you threw a ball in the real world. It's going to have gravity. They're going to dynamically uh, move away from each other if they bounce off of something. The problem is we're not getting our spelling, right? It's not staying where it's being born. So we're not getting that spell on effect. To do that, what you want to do is, first of all, click your uh, dynamic tag. And then down here, you're going to see all these options. There's a bunch of options, and I get into the, a lot of these options in other videos. But in this one, we're going to go to Force, and we're going to go to Follow Position. And all Follow Position does, uh, let's just set this to 6. Look at that. All Follow Position does is say, hey, wherever you're um, supposed to be, try to be there right? Like gravity still exists, um, you know, dynamics still exist, but if you're supposed to be spelling something or being a part of an object or whatever these clones are doing, don't just fling off into nowhere. Try to exist where you were born, right? Um, and that's what follow position does. Follow rotation does the same thing, but with rotation. So let's just do that as well. Now the spheres, you know, won't show that, but if we, as we add other particles, this is going to come in handy. So what's going on here? It's spelling out our, our word. We're getting this dynamic word here, really cool. And it's flinging around. However, the spheres are just kind of boring, right? You, this looks great, this is fine. But what if you want a little bit more variation in your objects? Well, you can do a couple things. First of all, a cloner accepts more than one object. So let me show you one way to do this. You can take something like, I don't know, a cube. Okay, that's way too big. Let's shrink that down. Let's drop a cube in our cloner and let's back up and let's hit play and see what happens. Well, the, the what's happening is the spheres are being dynamic and the cube is not because we didn't add that dynamics tag. Well, but instead of setting up a new dynamics tag and then going in and adding all this stuff, you can actually just copy and paste this tag. And the best way to do it is to hold down command on your keyboard and to drag it up into the new object. You see now there's two of these. We could rearrange this if, if it's bugging you that they're opposite. It's really not a big deal. But now each of these objects have the same dynamics tag. Let's back up to frame zero. Let's hit play. And you're going to see now we have cubes and spheres. Those cubes are way too big. Okay. Let's shrink them down. And I'm also going to add a little bit of rounded edges on these cubes. I'm just going to click this uh, fillet button here. It's going to make rounded edges. Just going to make make it look a little bit nicer. And now we're spelling this word with cubes and spheres, right? Pretty cool. Okay, so now what can we do? How else can we add variation? Well, we can uh, click on our cloner and let's go back up to our MoGraph tab here. And under the MoGraph tab, you're gonna see effectors. Now again, this is a relatively uh, simple tutorial we're gonna do today. 
We have tons of other tutorials at Grayscale Gorilla with you know more more uh, focus on, on the, some of these other effectors. Um, but today we're going to focus on the random effector. And if I click the random effector, you first of all want to make sure your cloner is selected. You want to add your random effector, and it's going to add randomness to each one of those clones. And you can see now they're kind of spread out. And that's by default, the random effector is affecting position. We don't want it to affect position. We want it to affect scale. And we also want it to affect uniformly. We don't want to scale things, you know, X, Y, and Z separately like that. You can see down in the corner there, it's kind of scaling it out. We want to instead click uniform scale and then affect each of them a little bit differently. So I'm going to crank this up pretty high, 0.7. And that's just going to mean that as these are being born, they're being born in different scales. So you can see some of the spheres are really large. Some of them are very small. Same with the cubes, right? And this is just going to help it look a little bit more random. The other thing I want to change, and if we back up a little bit, I want a, a typeface that is a little bit tighter together. So our letters are a little bit closer. And this is just going to give us a, a different effect, right? All these decisions that we're making are just making different effects as we change them. And what's really great about Cinema 4D is we could change them on the fly. We don't have to reanimate, rebake it, do anything like that. It's all procedural. And and it's uh, that just means that you could change things on the fly and uh, it's all non-destructive. That's a better word for it. it. Just means we could change stuff. So for example, if I wanted to change this to uh, one, two, three, four, we could do that. And now we have one, two, three, four being spelled just like that. We don't have to change anything else. So keep that in mind. Um, I'm going to go back to uh, my name just so we can uh, kind of start here. And the other thing I wanted to change was the um, uh, the typeface. So let's just go back to zero. And I want something a little bit tighter. Helvetica itself has a version that is called light. And you're going to see if I click light, it's a little bit tighter. This will look a little bit more natural as it spells on. But I, I want it even smaller. And if you have this typeface, uh, if you don't have this typeface, I recommend you go grab it. It's called Typograph Pro. It's actually made to work with 3D uh, specifically. It's a really great typeface, and it's got some really great weights on it. And what that means is we can go to, into its weighting and say ultralight. Now, let's go back to frame zero and check out ultralight. Ultralight is so tight together that when it spells on, it's so tight. It's like it's tracing over itself. It's got this really cool look and it makes a really um, readable uh, letter for what we're doing. So let's pause this. The only thing that's making this not readable is it's kind of packed too closely together. Okay, so how do we change that? Let's go to our text. Let's go to our horizontal spacing here and spread it out. Okay, we're just making room so that each one of these um, letters are readable at the end. Okay, so that's looking pretty cool. So what do we do from here? Well, on the example video, you saw that some of these things kind of flung off dynamically. Some of them stuck to the letters and some of them flung off. Well, how do we get that effect? Well, let's come up in here and add, what do we want to fling onto the floor? Let's go with, um, let's go with some cones, okay? First of all, too big, we don't want that. Let's shrink it down and make it about the same size. Let's bring it into the cloner so it's being born you know, as it draws on. And then again, we want this to be dynamic. Now here's the difference. These two objects, when they're being born, are dynamic and they have that uh, follow position on. What we want this one to do is, we want this to be dynamic, so let's turn on rigid body dynamics but we are not going to turn that force on, which just means they're just gonna fall down to the ground when they're being born. So now, all these cones, or whatever you put in here, remember, you don't, it doesn't have to be cones here. If you're following along, make this unique to whatever you wanna make it, put in different shapes, whatever you want. I'm gonna shrink these down again. But remember, we can add these subtle variations to make it a little bit different. Okay, so now we have our cubes and our spheres being born and sticking. We have our cones kind of falling on the ground, but they're just kind of falling into space. Instead, I want them to fall onto the ground. So let's grab a plane that's under this menu right here. Let's grab a plane and let's scale it up. Okay, I'm just grabbing our scale tool and dragging. And then I'm gonna grab our move tool and grab our Y position and just move it down. There we go. 
and, and this is just to be below the letters. And what we're going to use this floor for is to catch all these other particles that are bouncing around. Um, the way to do that is, again, to go to your simulation tags menu. And you can see that we have a lot of different types of simulations. Um, I, we go into a lot of these on other Grayscale Gorilla tutorials. You can check those out. Um, but today we're just going to concentrate on rigid body, which we've already used, and collider body. And all collider body means is, you know, what, what collider body means is, you know, make, make things bounce off of it, make it dynamic, but don't let it fall itself, right? So we don't want the floor to fall and have gravity. We want to tell the simulation that the floor is steady. So that's all that that does. It's a collider body now, which means as these particles hit the floor, it's going to kind of fall around. What's really cool is there's a lot of different settings in our dynamics. And again, we'll get it more into this in other videos. I just want to give you a little taste of this. You could turn down the bounce and you could turn up the friction, something like 90. And that's just going to mean when things hit the ground, they stick a little bit more, right? They're not going to roll around forever. It's not like ice. It's more like cement, right? More friction. So this looks pretty cool. What else can we do to this animation before we start getting into lighting and texturing? Well, because everything is non-destructive and everything's procedural, we can mix and match these shapes. Like we can make a drastically different look. If let, let's say we bring a sphere in that's really large and scale it down, you know, and make it relatively large. But let's kind of try to break it. And then let's bring in one of these dynamics tags. Again, I'm just holding down command, dragging it up, and one of these dynamics tags that sticks to where it's supposed to be. So now I'm spelling these giant letters. We might need more spacing. We definitely want to, you know, shrink this down, these spheres down a little bit. What else can we do? We could add other shapes. We could bring in uh, a capsule, right? And again, this cloner object is just going to iterate through these shapes. So I could bring in a capsule here. Let's make the capsule fall on the floor. The capsules will be part of the falling on the floor part. Uh, that is from our cone. So I'm just going to drag that in. So now we have <laughs> these giant capsules. They're way too big. Let's scale those down. Okay, we almost want those other ones to be like dust. Okay, very cool. Okay, so now we have our letters flinging on. We have our dynamics going, but I want it to go a little bit further. It, it, it kind of finishes spelling, and then it, and then the animation just stops right there. I want I want it to resolve, and you know this gets more into kind of motion design best practices stuff like that. We have other videos about that, but the the key to it is you want to make it readable. Right. If you're making something for fun or for a client or whatever, you know, you, especially if it's someone's name, you want them to go like, oh, it's hey, it says it says my name. That's cool. So we're, all we're doing is we, we added a little bit of extra time. And the way that I did that, I kind of rushed through that. Let me make sure that you saw what's going on. Is uh, I took our. Um, let me scale that back down. OK, I took our timeline. I said I want this to be 110 frames instead of 70. And yours might be 90. You can extend it however you want. And then I just drag this thing up to extend our timeline. Okay. So now what we have is our animation comes on. Boom. Boom. And then we have a little bit of readability time to kind of see like, oh, cool. Says, says my name. Okay. So what do we do now? We can, you know, alter and change and tweak this stuff. But the real fun part for me is not only just building these kind of things in cinema, but really learning how to texture and light them and make them look like, you know, cool things that would be on a, on a TV or on a commercial, right? So how do we start to go about that? Well, stay tuned toward the end of the video. I'll show you the way that I made the one, uh, the, the kind of demo that I showed you at the beginning. But I wanted to also show you this really fast way to texture and light something that requires no plugins that anyone could do to make this really fun cartoon look. So follow along here and we're going to make this go from just a gray, black and gray render to something really colorful and really fun. First of all, what we're going to do is create a new material. So new material. We're going to double click on this and open it up. We're going to turn off the color channel and we're going to go to luminance. And we're just going to concentrate on, on our luminance channel. And what I wanted to show you is called the variation shader. Now, variation shader has only been around for a year or two. So if you don't have it, you may have an older version of Cinema 4D. That's okay. If you don't have variation shader, I want you to just kind of pick your favorite color in here and then we'll move on. With If you do have variation shader, let me show you where it is. If you go to effects, variation, 
you're going to basically get um, a new color for every clone in the system. So this cloner object has all these other pieces and parts. And before this was really hard to do with the variation shader. All you have to do is drag that texture onto your cloner, hit render, and each one of those clones is a different color. And what's really nice is we can control what this color is. So let's go over some of these settings in here. First of all, I want this to be like rainbow colored. I'm going to open up our little twirl down here. I'm going to go to load preset. And I'm going to click full colors. And that's just preloading this rainbow gradient. There's a couple other things we need to do to make sure that it works. We want to turn up the gradient blend to 100%. And that's just going to say pull from this gradient. I'm going to go to random color, turn it all the way off. And then there's one more thing we have to do. Gradient mode, replace. And you can see there's a little preview up here. You can see it's literally pulling from this gradient to, to set all the clones. Now when we hit render, we get this awesome rainbow pattern. Okay, that is nice. We got some textures going on, but what about all the reflections or all the other stuff? We have this little highlight going on, but that's not very pleasing to the eye. We also have no shadows, no background, nothing else. What other ways can we kind of play with this stuff? Well, let's grab a light. And we, you know, if you're new to Grayscale Gorilla, we, we have a ton of tutorials about lights. But for now, I want you to just move it up and to the right. Okay. And now when you hit render, which is this button right here, you're going to see there's this nice little shape on the upper edge of our object. Um, it's got that nice little highlight. If we go into our shape and go or uh, go into our texture, go into reflectance and go into default specular, I just want you to kind of follow along. We're going to go more into this in other tutorials, but for now, I want you to make this really tall and really sharp specular. Okay. And all the specular is, is kind of like a fake reflection. It's a really fast render fake reflection. You can see when we make it big and real sharp, it looks like a little reflection, right? So we have that, we have our floor. Um, but again, we have no shadows. What is a good way that we can get some really good looking shadows without a lot of render time and all that kind of stuff? Well, for me, it's ambient occlusion. Let me show you where that is. We're going to go to render settings. If you don't see render settings, you can actually come in right here. This is the render settings button. It'll open up. I just have mine kind of tabbed in here. You can go to your render settings and you can go to effect and ambient occlusion. We're going to turn that on. We're going to go back and we're going to hit this render button. You're going to see it takes a little bit longer to render, but now what do we got? We got shadows. We got contact shadows. In fact, I'm going to render this to our, uh, a picture viewer just by hitting shift R shift R is going to render this to, to our picture viewer and you're going to see all this shadow detail. Now let me go back to our render settings. Let me turn off ambient occlusion, hit render and show you the difference, the before and after no shadows, shadows, right? And we're getting all that, all this stuff just with ambient occlusion. Boom, boom. Pretty cool. Even the floor, we have some contact shadows on the floor. So how do we make this look even better? Let's grab another material. Let's add that material to the floor, which is our plane. Okay. Let's go in and turn off reflectance. I don't want any, any reflection in here. I actually don't want color either. And this is a fun little cheat I use all the time. I want to turn on luminance and I want to just pick like, let's say a dark blue or something like that. Okay. So now when we hit render, we're going to get dark blue on the bottom. Let's turn our ambient occlusion back on. Let's see what we got. We have a nice dark blue floor. We got our shadow going down, looking pretty good. But what are we missing? Our background is not blue. We need a blue background. <laughs> How do we do that? Well, we go up to this menu right here, this floor menu, and we could say background. And then we just drag that same texture onto the background. And now when we render, we're going to have our floor shadow. And then we're going to have our uh, kind of word. And in fact, this color could be a little bit darker just to make it readable, right? I just want, I want our word to be a little bit more readable. And you can see now we have this dark background and we have our nice little colors going on. We have our reflection. In fact, if you want even more reflections, you could duplicate this light. All I did was grab the light. I hit command C and then command V to copy and paste. And you can move this light over 
and now you have extra reflection bits, right? Even more little shiny parts. You can see this renders very quickly. This is a great look, especially if you're new to Cinema 4D. You don't wanna mess with textures or lighting too much. You could use this look and get a really fun, cartoony kind of style. And of course, your background could be dark, it could be white. And we're basically getting to the part of the tutorial where we could just play forever, right? Now we have everything built, we could experiment and play around. This is our white background. This looks nice, we have some shadows. Totally different look with a white background. And let me show you how to really quickly set up this final animation for render. And then we're gonna jump into another way to kind of texture and, and light this scene that'll look a little bit more realistic. Um, Okay, let's go into our render settings. Now, if you're new to the render settings, you know, kind of follow along for now, and I'll try to explain what all this stuff means. But really what we're saying is, all right, what is our final render? When we hit go uh, in cinema, what does the final output look like? Well, first of all, what's the size of it? Well, in our output, we can set this to um, HD. In this case, it's 16 by nine. This is the ratio. This is HD ratio. and you could do things like 1280 by 720. That's a basic kind of HD uh, resolution. And if you want to render it larger, you could, you could do, uh, uh, let's see, it's basically 1920 by 1080. Boom. That's even larger, right? So this is going to be your final output resolution. You can see it's still 16 by 9. Our frame rate is 24. I default to 24. You, yours might be 30 frames a second. But you could change that here if you want, slow it down, speed it up. You also have this, this is really important. If you're trying to render an animation, your frame range is set to current frame by default. You wanna set this to all frames. And now you're gonna see it's gonna render frame zero to frame 110. Now, uh, because we are just messing with um, you know, our animation here, we wanna make sure uh, that this is, I'm gonna, bring this back down to 1280 by 720. And uh, what I'm tr what I'm trying to say is because this is a tutorial, I'm gonna shrink this down just so we can render it a little bit faster and you can see some progress before we move on. Now, it's gonna ask me, do you wanna save this somewhere? I'm actually uh, gonna say no. Uh, I actually didn't show you one other very important part, which is the save uh, menu. And you can go into your save menu here and uh, you can click this and name it and put it in a file and then that way it will actually render this out. I recommend uh, exporting TIFFs and I recommend 16-bit TIFFs. Okay? In this case, I'm not going to save it. I'm just going to render this out just to show you what this looks like. And you're going to see the animation is going to start to fling out here. Here's, a, here's our spheres and everything being born. You can see it's rendering very quickly. This technique um, that we have renders very fast, very dynamic, it's very quick. And you're just gonna wait until that's done. You can compile it in something like After Effects or you know any, any kind of uh, compositing software. You can start to play around with this stuff. Um, and, and that's it. So let me, let me stop this render. And I promised you earlier that uh, if you stuck around, I'm gonna show you the way that I textured and lit this um, demo that you saw at the very, very beginning. It looked a little bit different from this. It had a reflective floor. It had more realistic reflections. And I wanted to show you this because these are the plugins that we make here at Grayscale Gorilla. If you haven't seen these before, um, all I'm gonna do is basically turn off our lighting, turn off our background, and kind of get back to the point where it just looked like this. I'm even gonna turn off our ambient occlusion, okay? Now, boom, so that's kind of where we ended up. We have all of our dynamics sticking here and all these parts. Now, the reason we built a lot of our plugins is because you know a lot of us get to this point and, and they go, okay, well, I know how to build it and I know how to animate it and I know how to do all this stuff, but how do I make it look really good without all the details of learning how to adjust all these render settings and how to get realistic reflections and all that stuff. So we built a lot of our tools to kind of solve these problems and to solve them in a fast way. Because we know that a lot of you, you know, you're uh, trying to get a job or you have a job and you have clients and you want this stuff to be really fast. And so I just want to give you a little preview of some of our plugins that we sell at Grayscale Gorilla that try to speed up this process. I also want to show you what they do. So 
First of all, I'll go to my most used one. It's called HDRI Studio. And if you click on that, it's going to do a couple things. It's going to add a floor into the scene. And it's also going to instantly add reflections to the scene. And you're going to see those reflections in just a second when we add more reflections. Um, however, uh, we do need to add our dynamic floor, right? So let's just grab our plane. Let's scale it up. Let's add our simulation collider body. And then I'm just going to turn it off in the scene. And now I'm going to adjust both of these together down a little bit just below our, our letters here. And now what we get is our floor and we get our background, we get our gradient, we get it all together. Now, no shadows, nothing happening yet. However, part of HDR Studio Rig includes a, a ton of this right here, insert render settings. And so what we do here is when you click on insert render setting, it's going to bring up all these different render settings in, including an ambient occlusion setting that is even faster than the one that we just kicked off as a render. So if we turn that on, ambient occlusion low, I'm going to go back up here and hit render. And you're going to see now we have all these nice shadows and we have all these nice colors going on. However, what are we missing? Well, these little spheres here are missing their reflection. Now, reflection is why we built Top Coat, which is another plugin that we sell. You can check that out in the in the uh, description below if you're watching on YouTube or in our store on our on our website. And what Top Coat does is it allows you to build really custom, beautiful reflections on any of your textures. And uh, if you've seen other Grayscale Gorilla tutorials, you know I love good looking reflections, and that's why we built Top Coat to make it really easy to make this stuff. So. All you have to do is select the texture you want to affect, and then you can add these preset reflections right to it. In this case, I'm going to add just our basic lacquer reflection. I'm going to hit render, and you're going to see now we get our, our re realistic reflections on our spheres. Instead of just those dots, we're actually reflecting a studio. And what's really cool about HDR Studio is um, you can open up the browser, and let's go back to some of these studios here. And you could pick from any of these studios to adjust the render type and the lighting type. So this Diva Studio is going to give us a different look. Look at that. Now we have all those reflections popping in. Uh, and then also with other packs like European Holiday, we can go and add these in as well. This office space is one of my favorites. It's got really dynamic look to it. We may have to rotate it a little bit, but that's okay. We have some settings here for that. Let's rotate that around. And there we go. Okay, so we have some nice reflections going on. In fact, I'm going to pick one more just to try it. Uh, let's go with Church Entrance. This is a really fun one. Awesome. So we got this really bright reflection here. Really cool. But what about the floor? In the original demo, you saw the floor was kind of this blue and it had a reflective floor. So let's grab our HDR Studio. Let's go into our seamless floor controls. And first of all, let's just set that dark blue. Really dark blue to almost like a like a maybe a dark purple. Really dark. Okay, that's going to give us an entirely different look. That looks pretty good. Okay, now what about that reflective floor? This is how easy it is with HDR Studio. Um, you go down to your floor reflection. You turn up reflection. And then I'm going to add even a little bit of reflection blur. And that's just going to give us a really nice effect on the floor. Give us that real glossy feel. You can see how beautiful that is. And boom. So now with a couple of plugins, we sped that process up and it gave us a lot more flexibility to adjust it. And this is really key if you have clients. You know, you're just learning. It's okay. You can take time and, and experiment. But when there's clients involved and, you know, you're, you're trying to make this stuff for someone else, uh, time is really the issue. So that's why we built a lot of these plugins to change this stuff. So for example, I could go to our HDR Studio Rig uh, and I could rotate this reflection around. So it's not so straight on, it's more on the edge. There we go, so now it's more on the edge. In fact, let's grab a camera, which we haven't messed around with. I'm just gonna grab a camera and I'm gonna select it and zoom in. And you can see when we zoom in, we're gonna get all that nice shadowing and all this stuff rendering super fast. We get all this nice reflection on the edge. So now, how do we set up our final render uh, now that we have all this stuff set up? We have realistic reflections now. We have our, our reflective floor. We have all this stuff going on. Uh, let's go ahead and adjust that and do it. Seems like we've zoomed way out. 
Don't want to do that. There we go. Let's reframe everything here. Boom. And I should tell you, uh, all, all I'm doing is adjusting our uh, frame using one, two, and three on the keyboard. And what that is, is a rotation, scale, zoom in, and one, which is move around. Okay, so let's frame it up. We got our reflective floor. We got our animation going on. Go into our render settings. We pick where we want this to be saved. Now, here's the other part. Using these HDRI preset uh, preset renders, these are these render settings can be moved up and down depending on how uh, much time you have to render. So, for example, we want to do a final look. We can go to ambient occlusion high or even medium looks really good. Let's do a render with that. You're going to see it takes a little bit longer to render, but the grain is way down. Our reflection looks great, um, not only on the floor, but on our object. And now we're all set to go. So we, we can look at this and say, yep, that looks good. That looks like a final render that we need to do. Let's get it going. So now we can go to our render settings, do the same thing. We can come in here, center, set our resolution, and then go to our frame range, go to all frames, and set where you want to save it. And we could start rendering straight from here. So you can see it's going to kick off a render very quickly. Boom, frame one already done. Here comes our here comes our pink sphere. And then again, when this gets finished, you can compile these frames into something like After Effects or Fusion or Nuke or even uh, Premiere, you know, anything that will take a frame sequence and then you can animate that. And if you're um, interested in more of the compositing stuff, what to do after you render, we have ton more videos like that on Grayscale Gorilla as well. But I think we'll leave it here today. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining me. Thanks for watching. All right, thanks again for watching. Please subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so. And also check out our intro to Cinema 4D series if you're interested in learning more about Cinema 4D. The link is in the description down below and also try to make a card, and do all this YouTube stuff. Hopefully it'll pop up. Anyway, thanks again for watching. I'll see you in another tutorial really soon. Keep learning. If you haven't done so, if you haven't done so. If you haven't done so, if you haven't done so. How's my hair? Does it look okay?